minimize this so it doesn't get in their way. Okay. So. I'm going. Do you care? Yeah. Oh. Do I need to do anything? They're good. They're good. All right. You'll um, find your PowerPoint. Open. Open. Yes. Okay. Both the PowerPoints are open, but they're also in this folder in case they get lost. Okay. And I'll be right here. Okay. I can help. <laughs> Okay, I see that there are still, I see that we still have a few people signing in, but, uh, but we have jam packed a program for tonight. So I'm actually gonna get us started so that we can uh, uh, hustle over to the exhibition at 6.30 after our terrific speakers uh, present. So I wanna start uh, uh, just by acknowledging with respect the Onondaga Nation, fire keepers of the Haudenosaunee, the indigenous peoples on whose ancestral land Syracuse University now stands. I wanna say a huge thank you to you all. I know for a number of law students, this meant getting out a Syracuse University map that you don't always have to use and coming across campus. And uh, I, I appreciate you being here. I am so excited about the panel that we've assembled and uh, very appreciative of our sponsors. So uh, I'll just say a quick thank you to the Bon Shenick and King uh, series on race and justice in central New York, the Art Museum. Many thanks to Emily Dittman who reached out to me with the idea for a program and, and collaborating back in the fall. Um, Kim Wolf Price uh, at Bon Shenick and King has been a, a terrific partner. Uh, Paula Johnson and Suzette Melendez, my colleagues at the law school. Uh, our other co-sponsors are the Central New York Women's uh, Bar Association uh, and the Onondaga County Bar Association, who's uh, uh, doing all the CLE logistics for tonight. Please make sure if you're an attorney here that you do sign out after the program. Uh, I think that's, uh, those are the uh, logistical pieces. And now I'm gonna just do a quick um, uh, introduction of our program participants. So I'm hoping, I know my students have access to the program materials. I know that the OCBA was providing packets out front and you have detailed uh, uh, biographies of all of our excellent panelists. So I'm only gonna do brief introductions tonight so we can get to them. Colleen Gibbons, one of our College of Law alums and a frequent collaborator, uh, is the deputy director of the Center for Court Innovations Upstate Office. She works on a variety of state court initiatives, including supporting the expansion of opioid courts, uh, developing new projects in the criminal, civil, and family court systems, and overseeing the office's numerous existing initiatives. I know she's gonna talk about some of those initiatives tonight. We'll be joined in a little bit uh, by my colleague, Professor Paula Johnson, who is a professor of law at the uh, College of Law, a newly appointed member of the Franklin uh, Williams Judicial Commission, and the director of the College of Law's Cold Case Justice Initiative. Uh, uh, professor Johnson's gonna speak about her work uh, amplifying the voices of incarcerated women uh, uh, during her part of the program later. And if you saw in the materials, we featured a number of chapters from two of her books that have focused on this work. And then I'm delighted to be joined tonight by Nylika Brown, who is the Prison Rape Elimination Act Coordinator at Vera House. Uh, she, <clears throat> prior to joining Vera House, she was a community service officer with a local police department for seven years. She also has served as a volunteer with their web chat service. As many of you know, Vera House uh, is one of 10 New York State domestic and sexual violence agencies that offers specialized services to incarcerated individuals with the goal of eliminating prison rape and sexual assault. Uh, so I want to thank her for being here as well. And then before uh, Colleen starts her presentation, and actually while Colleen's getting uh, geared up, I'm just going to give it to Kim to say a few things about the award-winning Race and Justice series. Uh, the, you guys just won the Innovators Award. Are you going to say that? Yeah. I, I, okay, we should. We did. We won the New York State Bar Association's uh, Innovators Award. So um, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, I'm Kim Wolf Price from the law firm Bon Chenick and King. Um, Tonight's collaborative program is um, the work of the Race and Justice in Central New York series sponsored by Bon Chenick and King. And it really has been an amazing collaboration between the Onondaga County Bar Association, Syracuse University College of Law, and a number of local law firms um, who have dedicated time and funds to this program. It started with a community book read 
in 2020 of the book Just Mercy and has grown and flourished since that time. And I think for many of us has been an important experience throughout this pandemic time. Uh, thank you to everyone who made this possible. Of course, Lauren, who um, I miss very much all the time. Um, for those of you who don't know, we used to be colleagues on the same floor. Um, and to Emily for bringing this to us and this great panel tonight. We really appreciate also all of you coming out tonight. These are important issues and having um, students learn about this and participate is important. And of course, thank you to all the lawyers who've joined us. Please be on the lookout for future programs from the Race and Justice in Central New York series. This Bonchenik and King series on race and justice in Central New York has been an important um, way for us to educate ourselves, to learn more and to bring light to issues of um, racial injustice in our communities. So thank you all and thank you to the panel. Thanks, Lauren. Okay, is everyone able to hear me all right? Okay, yes, I'm doing it. Um, so it's great to meet you all today. I'm gonna step to the side so I can see most people. Um, my name is Colleen Gibbons. Uh, I really appreciate being here. This is a short snippet of a presentation that I do um, with a colleague of mine, Monica Christofferson at the Center for Court Innovation. Um, and we present this to different states, generally on women in treatment courts. Forgot to check my time, I'm good. Um, so when we do this presentation, we start off generally by laying some foundations. So there's three foundational slides that I really want to discuss today um, that's, that's important for just addressing when we talk about women, when we talk about um, this population, what that looks like. And so sometimes people say, well, obviously we know what this is, right? But, but really when we're talking about women, there's different ways to identify um, and there's different ways that that is classified, especially when it comes to the court system, which we know can often be a little bit rigid. So the idea of sex assigned at birth, um, that is the sex that you are assigned at birth. Often you'll say it's a girl, that's what that means. Um, gender expression is the way that you express yourself. So um, often if you are wearing a dress, you might be perceived as a woman, right? You are expressing your gender in a certain way. Um, gender identity is the way that you identify yourself. So often, especially in the Zoom reality that we live in, when we sign into a Zoom, we will add our name and then you might see in parentheses, what your gender pronouns are. So those are the pronouns that you choose to use. That's how you self-identify. In courts, sometimes what a woman is, is not um, the same as what someone may identify as, right? So it depends on the ways that courts structure these systems when we talk about women. The next foundational slide that um, is really important to discuss is this idea of intersectionality. And that actually comes from a legal term from um, Kimberly Crenshaw, who is an attorney herself who coined that. And what we do when we talk about intersectional is really look at different dynamics. So when we're talking about women in, in courts, um, these are things that don't happen just because you're women. There's different layers of identity that come along with this, right? Um, so talking about women exclusively and kind of treating women without understanding these other axes of their identities that come along with that can be very difficult. So. The next couple slides after this um, are generally um, kind of data heavy and they focus on women. But when we talk about these things, we want to be clear that um, all of these different power dynamics and cultural kind of pieces come into play and they can be layered and they can be intersectional in a way that is really hard to just break down by all of these different um, structures, right? Um, and you'll see up in the top corner, this little, um, this little box, it says nearly two thirds of incarcerated women in jail are women of color, 44% are black, 15% are Hispanic, and 5% are of other racial or ethnic backgrounds. All of the data in this um, short presentation are um, from the Vera Institute and for um, these little boxes specifically are from that. So another thing that I really like to lay a foundation for is when we talk about the system, right? So often we'll say people touching the system or the ways that the system interacts. And many people understand that just to be the justice system. But when we think about our world and the reality and the way that we live, there are many different systems that come into play that we need to consider when we're talking about a carceral system, right? It's not just the fact that you are in the legal system. It's the fact that your family system is affected. Right? And there's other systems that we talk about, the child welfare system, 
the family court system, which is outside the criminal justice system. So these are different pieces that come into play that are really important to consider and the ways that all of these can affect identity and can kind of be layered. I love this chart because it, it shows like this person is in the middle, but here are all of the other things that are affected in their lives. So now we get into um, what I call the part of the PowerPoint that is not um, best practices because there's too much data and too many words. So um, my apologies, you um, will be able to see some of this after, but it's important. Um, I know in the handouts, you'll see some of these charts anyway, but it's important to look at really what women, um, you know, how women are showing up in the, um, in the, the criminal justice system. So the fastest growing incarcerated group is women. Um, women's state prison populations, they've grown 834% over 40 years in the US, 834%. That's a gross number. Um, and that's more than double the pace of the growth among men. Um, women's incarceration has grown at twice the pace of men's incarceration in these recent decades and is disproportionately due to local jails. So you can see that top chart, it shows um, prison, uh, federal, pr federal prison, state prison and jail, and that jail number has increased very much. Um, data that I've been able to find when we talk about this, they don't explain really kind of what happens because when we talk about the criminal justice system and the prison populations, it's a general prison population and doesn't always address women specifically, even though these numbers are growing so dramatically. Um, because those jail numbers are growing so much, um, it's really important to look at what, what these differences are. Um, and so uh, this top chart here is a Maryland jail. Maryland actually has the most, um, uh, the highest prison population and the highest jail population. Um, New York, that number looks a little bit different, um, but still it's grown over 20, over 4%, or four, it's grown over four times in that time span from 1970 to uh, 2015. So although men's jails, jail admissions have declined, that is not the same for women, right? So these are two different lines. Um, and that increase is mostly due to that jailing population. Women are nearly one out of every four jail admissions. Um, and that used to be a much lower number. One of the things that's really interesting is looking at a dichotomy, right? So what that looks like in larger urban areas and what that looks like in rural areas. And it's really in some of these smaller counties that that growth has increased. Um, in small counties, that number has gone up 31 fold between 1970 and 2014. Um, and most of the increase, and this is generally a, a presentation that I do for um, treatment courts anyway, but it's interesting to note that most of that increase in women's jail admissions is related to drug charges. So understanding what that looks like and saying, okay, we, we kind of know where those charges are coming from. Now, how can we address it? So one thing that's really interesting to look at outside of all of the data that you have, and I know that in the handouts, there's a really great um, data packed handout is looking at what this looks like for women. So we know that women who enter the justice system, who are incarcerated, have a much higher history of abuse, trauma, and mental health than men. Incarcerated women have higher rates of chronic health issues, um, physical and mental health conditions, as well as substance use. Um, and it's interesting because the way that we look at women in the justice system is that they are in need of being criminalized, but we can also look at the fact that they have these um, different victimizations in their history. So it's important to take into consideration these traumatic life events that are that women who are um, in women who are incarcerated are experiencing. Um, that prevalence of victimizations uh, image is when I saw like you can read data, right? I'm throwing data out at you and you're saying, okay, I hear this, I hear this. But when you see that 86% of people who are, in, women who are incarcerated have experienced sexual violence, 77% of women who are incarcerated have experienced intimate partner violence and 60% have experienced caregiver violence, that's really telling, right? Thinking about those things. And you can go back to that original slide that I showed of 
the systems and think about how that spins out into all of those systems and what that looks like. So going back to that, think about the family and what that does to the family. So one of the things when we think of those systems is that often they're kind of delineated, right? What happens in the criminal justice system isn't, doesn't take into account the effect on families. So criminal justice system says we need to punish these women and we're going to incarcerate them, right? That doesn't help the children and the families of the women who are incarcerated. The data show that the majority of the women who are in jail and prison are mothers to minor children. Most were in fact a primary caregiver to those children. And what we can see is that women who are incarcerated, they are at much higher risk of um, misconduct and reoffending if they have these stressors, separation, challenges to staying in touch with their families, issues in planning for reunification, strained finances and support systems. That's really important to consider when we're thinking about how to fix these family systems and how to address the issues of women in, in, in jails and prisons. It is interesting in doing this research and looking this up that some states do actually require their courts to consider the impact of a parent's incarceration on a child or elderly or ill family members. So there are a few that do that. I know Illinois does that. I'm not sure about New York. Um, I've looked, I haven't seen it, but many of you are lawyers here who focus on this. And if you know that, feel free to let me know um, after. So the takeaway of this very like short blast is that what we really need to do is redefine this narrative. And these are quotes from a woman who worked in um, the Illinois, um, in a prison in Illinois. She was, um, she worked for years actually in a prison in Illinois, and then she started a criminal justice organization um, after that because the experience was traumatizing not only for her, um, but she recognized the impact that that work had on, on the prison population. And her quotes say, I would say most if not all of the women entering jails have been exposed to some sort of trauma. And when they enter into jails and prisons, it becomes overwhelming. The whole process of incarceration for everyone continues to dehumanize and remove dignity from a person who already is experiencing difficulty with hope. And so I changed um, some of that language just so you can see. Gender responsive and trauma informed care can lead to humanization, can, re can rebuild dignity and can provide hope for some of these women who come into contact with the justice system. So that holistic approach is really the, the way that we need to work with women who are um, experiencing incarceration, um, providing for mental wellness, substance use, education, and job training. Those are things that there's actually data to show that if those are provided, that helps with some of those outcomes um, for women who have experienced the justice system. Apologize for being so fast. Hopefully I made it in time. Thank you so much. Okay. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm very nervous. I apologize. Um, how do I even follow that up? Colleen, you are amazing. <laughs> um, thank you for having me and thank you all for being here today. Um, when you look at the percentages of the women incarcerated um, and how it has increased, what's mind boggling to me is that most of my contact that I've had have been with male um, incarcerated individuals. Um, so my name is Nylika Brown and I am the PREA project coordinator at Vera House. Um, Vera House mission is to prevent, respond to, and 
um, partner to end domestic and sexual violence um, and other forms of abuse. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And we are one out of 10 Priya centers that provide this kind of support, which um, was mentioned already. And the services that I am able to provide is emotional support for individuals, um, crisis intervention, advocacy, accompaniment to forensic exams um, or interviews. And we do not have to report any incidents to docs. So to the Department of Corrections or to, um, for me, it will be Onondaga County um, facilities. The goals and topics that I'll be covering today are overview of what PREA is, the key provisions of PREA, high instances of prison rape, um, the shortcomings of the act, and what I believe the next steps in eliminating sexual violence would be. Um, so a general overview, Prison Rape Elimination Act was passed um, by Congress in 2003. Um, the purpose of the act is to provide for the analysis of the incidents and efforts to, of prison rape in federal, state, and local institutes, and to provide information, resources, recommendations, and funding to protect individuals from prison rape. Um, the act also created the National Prison Rape Elimination Commission which um, drafted standards for eliminating prison rape. And the standards were created in June of 2009. And then they were turned over to the Department of Corrections, but they weren't um, published until June of 2012 and then became effective August of 2012. Key provisions of PREA um, adhere to a um, zero tolerance standard for sexual abuse and sexual harassment development of standards for detection, prevention, reduction, and punishment of prison rape, collection and dissemination of the information on the incidents of prison rape, and award of grant funds to help state and local governments implement that. So when you look at the stats, um, I was only able to find the most recent stats were from 2014 to 2018. Um, the total number of sexual abuse and sexual harassment allegations increased from the 2017 and 2018 um, year span is what I'll be focusing on. It has increased 33%. So sexual staff misconduct, which is the attempted or requested sexual acts, indecent exposure, invasion of privacy, and staff voyeurism, voyeurism um, that has increased 31%. Staff sexual harassment allegations, which is the repeated verbal statements and comments or gestures, um, has increased 46%. Non consensual inmate on inmate sexual contact, which is penetration without consent of or from um, an incarcerated individual, or if they cannot give consent or have refused, um, that has increased 28%. Abusive sexual inmate and on inmate contact, unwanted intentional touching that has increased by one. And then inmate sexual harassment is, there in, is the repeated and unwanted sexual advances, requests for sexual favors or verbal comments. And that has increased 91%. <laughs> um, the rate of reported allegations of sexual victimization. Um, so, this is a good thing that it has increased from 7.5 per 1,000 indivi um, individuals to 10.4, because that means that more people are reporting. Sorry. So there are three classifications for resulting determination and they are substantiated, unsubstantiated and unfounded. So substantiated is an allegation, the, the allegation was investigated and there was enough evidence, meaning the preponderance of evidence in order to take the next steps. Um, unsubstantiated is that it was investigated, but there was not enough evidence to prove that such incident has taken place. And unfounded mean that it was investigated, but it was determined not to have occurred. So in 2018, 5.1% of allegations were substantiated, meaning that they occurred, like there were enough evidence, the preponderance of evidence. Um, 6.9, I mean, 69.7% were unsubstantiated, 
meaning that it was investigated and it was found to not have occurred. No, it was investigated, but there was not enough evidence to say if it did or did not occur. And then unfounded was 23.3%, meaning that they investigated it and it did not occur at all. Shortcomings of the act. So individuals are continuing to be sexually victimized. So we have to do our best to put a better plan in place to aid in reporting in the support of decrease, um, decreasing victimization. And another key is that it's hard to prove harassment, verbal harassment. So if there's not any witnesses or um, if both parties are not saying that it happened, then of course it's gonna be unfounded. So that's a lot of reasons why there are um, unfounded reports. It's underreported. So sometimes if it was a staff member who um, it's being that it's being alleged is the alleged suspect, then um, they may not want to report because it's internal investigations, meaning that another staff member is the one who's investigating. So they don't want to come forward. And then that leads to um, retaliation, which they begin to hold their commissary or their mail. They're being given tickets and being placed in segregated housing for disciplinary reasons, whether it happened or it did not happen. Um, some people don't wanna report because their release date is coming up. So if their release date is coming up, they don't wanna be retaliated against. And if they're retaliated against, sometimes that can affect them. If they're given tickets, then that can prolong their process of actually being released or their good time. Um, if you report too many in, um, incidents and it becomes unfounded or um, um, unsubstantiated, if they believe that you're continuing to report things that have not happened, then sometimes they'll take your good time away from you and you have to stay in longer. Um, the LGBT community and those who are mentally ill are at a greater risk for being sexually victimized. Um, for the LGBT community, although there are standards in place to protect them, they are still getting backlash and consequences for the need of certain undergarments and separate shower times or other um, things. Some county facilities are not fully adapting to the standards, calling, causing further trauma to those trying to reach out to their nearest Prius center. Um, resistance to the change of mindset and behavior. So if someone has worked there for over 20 years, sometimes they don't want change. So they already have that mindset that rape is a part of the punishment. So they don't take some of these allegations serious and staffing issues. That's it. Oh. And next steps, <laughs> if we work together, work together to provide education, training, um, better jobs, careers, like different things for um, the people once they get back out into the community, then, you know, maybe that'll stop them from re-entering prison. We have to have people willing to change the system, disrupt the status quo, the norms, dismantle the justice system that's causing harm. Um, if there was camera and audio systems in these facilities to help individ um, hold individuals accountable, body cameras definitely um, have been helping um, further trauma-informed training for facilities and their Prius centers. So if we're working together, if we're in these trainings together, then maybe that'd be um, better for our clients, Inter um, external investigations. So instead of it being internal, if there's more external investigations, maybe these allegations would be taken more serious and we would find more substantiated cases than unsubstantiated. And let's give them a chance, break these barriers of stability and success. And one quote that I find helpful for me in my everyday um, work is you have been assigned this mountain so that you can show others it can be moved by Mel Robbins. I'm Robbins. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Oh, thank you.
Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. As I say to my students, project. <laughs> okay, I hope I'm not, I hope, are we, are we on? Yeah, okay. we're good. Thank you so much. All right. So I wanted to say that um, I did that work, as I said, before, before law school and then during. Um, I worked at a district attorney's office in Massachusetts um, in what would now be called the Special Victims Unit. Um, so it focused on things like domestic violence, rape, sexual assault. Um, vulnerable populations. Right? And as it happened, you know, many of these are elected positions. So as it happened, the DA whom I, uh, whose office uh, that I was working for, um, was running on a platform that they were going to take women's concerns seriously, right, including sexual assault and abuse. Um, and because I was known in the community for this work I was doing and that I was a uh, you know, law person, um, would I join their office, right? Because this was a pledge, this was a campaign pledge. Um, and I had almost literally written the book about how DAs ought to handle these concerns when women came to try to make complaints. So they said, join, you know, join our office. And that is how I came to be in the Middlesex County District Attorney's Office in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and all of Middlesex County. So that work plunged me into not just the grassroots aspect of this, but also the very direct legal aspect of it to make the criminal justice system responsive to women in ways that they had not been before. Um, and I will tell you that from the start, it was uneasy, but I still thought that it was something that I was able to do to contribute to communities that I cared about, that all of these institutions ought to be responsive to everyone in equal ways. So the ways that it became more untenable for me and disturbing was that Black women would come into police stations, DA's offices be disregarded, right? Until they might see somebody like me who took their concerns seriously in all the ways that that institution is supposed to do. Right? But there's also the reality that being the uh, racist society that we are, that women of color in particular were concerned about not magnifying a problem of race and racism as it applied to their abusers. So once again, they're kind of caught between, you know, this rock and a hard place because they are being harmed, but they also know that this system treats all of us disproportionately harshly. And so they were loath to make complaints even while they were hurt and hurting, right? So doing that, one of the other things that I began to observe, right, and it wasn't, didn't take long, but I observed that for many of the women who came in seeking assistance from the violence, right, they looked just like the women who were coming into the criminal justice system who were being charged with offenses. In fact, in any number of cases, they were the same women, right? Some woman who tried to make a complaint about violence was being charged with some criminal offense, right? And I began to look at that even more closely to try to get to the underpinnings of it. And the women on either side of the system were saying the same things about their lives. Right? What were the things that were going on for them in their lives? And how these institutionalized aspects of race and gender, um, in a number of cases, poverty as well, right? 
um, had this kind of impact on them, right? So it's the same women, really, saying the same things on both sides of the system. And so the germ for uh, inner lives, you know, began as I was just amassing all of this sense, um, in some ways of the paradoxes, um, in some ways because things just were so obvious, but they weren't being told. And so somewhere in my head, I had resolved that I want to be part of telling that story. And I wanted to do it in a way that was as comprehensive as I could possibly offer to do. Now, I hope that a number of you have actually seen the exhibit over here at the museum um, because it's excellent. I mean, it's excellent for what it does. It's excellent for how it does it. So if you haven't, I think it's up till March or something, be sure to see the exhibit because what you see there um, and what I attempted to do with inner lives and interrupted life was to make sure that you heard the multiplicity of voices to bring their insights and experiences onto this issue. So it includes the data and, 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 and I know that you've heard the, the statistics. So I'm not gonna go over that, right? You know that they're out of kilter, you know, totally disproportionate. You all know that, right? But here's what you probably don't know. And that is how the women experience that data. So I wanted to include the data, the historical analysis, right? Because for black women, right, this disproportionate impact has happened since the founding of this nation. My research goes back to colonial times as to how black women have been treated disproportionately in the criminal justice system up to today. And again, that is whether they are considered accused or defendants or whether they are victims of crimes, right? And as a large part of our history, black women could not be victims of crime. Rape was not a crime when committed against black women. Right? So that history is important to know because it helps us to understand why that disproportionate response and disparate impact in terms of incarceration continues to happen because it's baked into our system and it continues, right? So that's in inner lives, right? The legal analysis, the empirical analysis, the historical analysis. But what was missing from so many volumes and treatments of this subject as I had been researching and working on for so long was we didn't hear the women's voices. And so I had resolved that any book that I did was going to put the women's voices front and center. It was going to be as much a part of it as all of those other aspects. And so this is how that book evolved. This is how it developed. Um, and so the process of it was um, that I solicited participants and you know, some of you I'm sure are you know, familiar with the IRB process and so forth. You do that, right? You know, particularly involved when you're talking about vulnerable populations like people in prison. You do your IRB for your institution, your educational institution, and for the uh, you know, correctional, the prison institution. All right, so there's all of those steps to try to get inside of the prison to talk directly to the women. Okay. And if there's, any, if there's anything that you might take from what that experience was like, it would be this, this is an anecdote that I, have sometimes told because the you know the folks inside they you know they work quote unquote they have you know jobs inside the institutions and so the women's institutions are no exception and sometimes those jobs are in administrative spaces yeah 
So as I sent my proposal in to do this book that was focusing on black women in prison, right? Um, sometimes the institutions would return it back to me and say, you know, mm, need a little bit more. And don't let me go over too much, Lauren. But I want to tell this, you know, they say, you know, you have to, you have, you have to send some more, you know, some more. So I get my proposal back and I'd send the more and they send it back and they say, we need some more. I say, okay, there's a pattern here. But I would not stop because I could tell, right, I was being stymied in this effort to get in here and talk to the women. So finally, there were no more no's. There was no more reason, right? You know, couldn't, you know, couldn't find another reason or pretext to say you can't get in here and talk to the women. So I finally get into the institution. And I get there. Um, and I'll never forget this, that a couple of the women who greeted me. Uh, said, we can't believe that you are finally here. And I didn't know what they meant. I, I mean, in a sense. They said, because we have seen proposals come through this institution with far less documentation, justification, analysis, rationales, but those researchers were white and the name of your book exclusively was about black women's voices. And we had not seen anybody have to go through what you went through to get in here to talk to us. And we are so glad that you stuck with it. So the women knew, they, I didn't know that the women knew what was going on. And I'm sure that they didn't expect that I was actually going to follow through. Like so many others, I'm sure just sort of fell by the wayside because who would keep going through that process? But I was as determined to follow through as they were to thwart my efforts. And so I got there and this is what they said because we didn't think anybody cared about us. We didn't think anybody cared about telling or hearing from black women who were in prison, right? So I say that too, because um, when, you, when you go to the exhibit, you see these little placards it has to do with the flowers and gardening um, that's associated with the exhibit and what they mean. And so I tell that anecdote and this whole overview, because the one that I connect to especially is the forget me not, because this is what the women talk about, right? Women's prisons are so far away from the women's communities. And as you've heard, many of them are parents. They are single parents. They are single parents of minor children. And one of the most distressing thing for women in prison is how difficult it is for them to maintain any regular contact with their children. And it would seem counterintuitive, wouldn't it? That we would make those relationships so difficult to maintain. Because for so many of them, that's the incentive to try to do something differently with their lives. But here's the other thing. And this is why I say, talking to the same women, because they would talk about the experiences of abuse as children, such that no one may have paid attention to them. Things that maybe some of you in here would just find unfathomable, right? Abuse in your household, abuse from people outside of the household, but familiar to you happening, telling someone, not being believed. How do you cope with that if you're nine or 11 
were 13 years old. So they did things to help soothe themselves. And some of those things that they did, we call crime. They did substance abuse, right? They did prostitution. They did things to support themselves because we also know that living wages for women and men are also disproportionate. So they did things that we call theft. Rarely though, did they do things that we call violent crime. Not to say that there weren't some, there were. But the vast majority of women who are in prison are there for low level offenses. And even for those who are there for violent offenses, Black women, Latinx women, get harsher penalties for those cases. If you get a chance to read Inner Lives, you'll see some of those stories. A woman who was in prison in the book for killing her abuser, right? had been abused, all the evidence, and some of you, I think, are law students here, right? You're familiar, lawyers, you know, you're familiar with, you know, better women's syndrome, how that can be recognized or not recognized. But here's what she said. My lawyer never mentioned better women's syndrome to me. Told me, this is what the state is offering, and you should take it. Simple as that. So I like to tell that to, to students especially, because there are folks who will want to work for the government, DAs, AGs, but I'm heartened by the fact that there are also people who say they want to be defense attorneys. But this is what I want to ask you for those who want to be defense attorneys. Are you the person like the women I've spoken to and have worked with who say, I met my attorney in the morning and they were pleading me out in the afternoon. So arraignment to disposition. Never asked me my perspective. Never asked me what happened. Now I would say that this is just, you know, anecdotal and some idiosyncratic thing, but I heard it from too many black women who said they're defense attorneys, right? That person who stands between you and the rest of the system never asked them about their cases. Never asked them about the beatings, the brutality, the rapes, but said, you should take that plea. And so serving life sentences. Right? So these are the things that I wanted to bring out so that anybody working in this system, anybody in this society would be able to read this and hear what the women say, not just the experts and the academics. And I'm probably over time, so let me finish with this. I want because there's another aspect of this, um, and that's why the exhibit um, resonates with me so much. You know, some of my you know colleagues here know this. Um, you know that I am also a photographer, and so when I say I wanted to bring all aspects of myself to this project, the other aspect that I wanted to bring was the photography. Um, so if you've seen any of the you know, excerpts from what we've provided, you, you'll see a couple of the women's stories, Joyce Logan, um, and uh, who else did I provide for you? Sorry, uh, Joyce and both Joyce's actually, Joyce Ann Brown and Joyce Logan, both women from Texas. And so you see their images uh, in the materials. Uh, along with others who agreed to be photographed. And that was a whole other story. Getting in was one thing, getting in with my cameras was something else. 
But I wanted to do that because I wanted people to see that they, that they had seen these women before. They weren't anomalies. They weren't Martians. They were people probably in your community, maybe even in your family. But I wanted there to be a sense of recognition and so if we could not deny that this was happening, if we could not deny who they were, maybe we'd be motivated to try to do something to change it, to reach some solution. So those are all of the aspects of it um, in doing inner lives. Uh, and the women themselves have a sense about what they think should be part of the solutions to this mass incarceration especially the gender-based aspects of them in our society. So I'll stop there and be really interested in having a further conversation with you, but thank you so much. I hope that that has been informative um, and helpful to understand where we stand on these issues at this moment. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Paula. I'm going to ask my three students to come up uh, and take seats up on the stage, and I'll step down here. And I'm going to do very brief introductions uh, uh, of them. Uh, Jamila Suleiman, Molly Graham, and Matthew Mares were all students in my seminar this uh, fall. They did research projects that were outstanding, that focused on issues that I felt connected directly with the presentations that you've already heard and with the exhibition that I hope all of you will, uh, will go see after the program. I'm not gonna do more detailed intros because I want the substance of your work to take the remaining time. So thank you guys so much. And Jamila, you're first, right? Yeah. You want this one? All right, hi everybody. Like Professor Golden said, my name is Jamila Suleiman. Um, I am comfortable with any pronouns, including she, her, and he. I mean, she, they, and he, sorry. I'm a 2L at the law school and I took a criminal justice reform seminar last semester with Professor Golden. And today I'll be presenting one of the papers that I wrote for that class last semester. It was titled um, Poverty and Incarceration, Pipeline or Feedback Loop. And it was focused primarily on describing and characterizing the relationship between poverty and mass incarceration. And um, of course, when we're talking about um, women's incarceration issues, especially when of women of colors incarceration issues, poverty is really central to that. Um, both black and Latina women experience poverty at a rate about, of about 25% in the United States. So it's extremely important to think about that relationship when we're talking about criminal justice reform. Um, and specifically what I wanted to address in my paper um, was an assessment and sort of a reevaluation of pipe, the language of a pipeline that we use a lot in the criminal justice reform space. Um, we talk about pipelines in terms of the school to prison pipeline. We've also talked about it in terms of poverty to prison pipeline. And um, I think it's important to think about those relationships because it's pretty clear. Let me switch. Sure. I'm so sorry. No problem. I think the caption is set. Okay. Thanks, Paula. No problem. Okay. Is that better? Is that better? Yeah. Sorry for the All right. Well, um, so it's been pretty well established that poverty can lead to incarceration. Um, a study by the Prison Policy Initiative in 2014 showed that incarcerated people had a median annual income of less than 20,000 a year, which is 41% less than non-incarcerated people of similar ages. And for Black and Latina women, the difference is even more stark where their median annual incomes are usually less than $12,000 a year. So um, in my paper, I discussed all of the historical mechanisms from about the 1960s to the present that might account for this correlation between poverty and incarceration, including Kennedy and Johnson administration 
policies that integrated law enforcement um, operations with the existing welfare apparatus to reforms under the Clinton administration, specifically to TANF for food stamps that conditioned aid on things like passing drug tests, job stability, um, and things like that. And it also allowed law enforcement to use welfare records to find and arrest people with outstanding arrest warrants. And I also talked about in the modern era where we over police poor neighborhoods under order maintenance policing strategies. We criminalize homelessness with almost 53% of cities banning public sleeping. We deny public housing for those with criminal records. I could go on um, for ages about all of the ways that we continue to criminalize poverty in the United States. But ultimately, my argument is that while incarceration can lead to poverty, I mean, poverty can lead to incarceration. Incarceration can also lead to poverty and outcomes for those who were formerly incarcerated um, and then leave the formerly incarcerated vulnerable to all of the ways that we criminalize poverty in the United States. So for example, like I said before, if you have a criminal record, you'll be denied public housing, student loans, there's barriers to becoming employed and obtaining um, licenses for certain um, occupations. In 30 states, you're excluded from food stamps if you have a criminal record. And all of these things mean that um, seven out of 10 people recidivate within the first uh, five years after their release with most occurring in the first year. And so I guess what I really wanted to draw attention to in my paper was that idea, the, the fact that it's not just that poverty can lead someone to become incarcerated, but being incarcerated means you might end up in poverty and you get stuck in this feedback loop and if we ignore that second part of it, we're not taking a holistic enough approach and thinking about all of the reforms that we need to make to our social supports, to our welfare apparatus, to ensure that we support people when they leave prison and um, help them to not recidivate. Um, so yeah, that was essentially what I wrote about. Hey everyone, give me one moment here to do this. Okay. So, hi everyone. My name is Molly Graham. I'm a 3L. Uh, I took Professor Golden's class, uh, Criminal Justice Reform Seminar, last semester. Uh, my final paper was titled Pregnant in Prison An Analysis of Pregnancy and Mothering Behind Bars. Um, so, before I continue, I just wanted to reiterate. Um, that I acknowledge the language surrounding women's health, uh, the terms women, reproductive rights, and women's health reinforce a gender binary and focus on heterosexual, cisgendered people. So I'm using the term women, uh, women's health, and uh, reproductive rights as a theoretical framework, um, inclusive, inclusive, excuse me, of all bodies who experience menstruation and pregnancy. So my paper was broken up into three core pieces, prenatal care, birth, and postnatal care. For time purposes, I chose to focus on uh, the first issue that um, women face in prison regarding prenatal care. I chose to do this for two main reasons. Uh, the first reason being that the vast majority of women entering a facility, a detention facility, are of childbearing or childbearing age and can benefit from early pregnancy detection. And secondly, if women are not pregnant, they can still benefit from some of the alternatives that I propose later in my paper. So some of the problems that I identified, um, and this is a very brief overview, but I'd be happy to talk about um, the problems more in depth later, uh, include a lack of accreditation that focuses on the needs of women, pregnant women, and postpartum women. Uh, the National Commission on Correctional Health and the American Correctional Association have voluntary accreditation programs aimed at improving the quality of healthcare in jails and prison, prisons, excuse me. However, there's no accreditation program that focuses on the needs of pregnant women and postpartum women. My research also found that only a third of facilities have a straightforward procedure for directing staff to inform women of their right to an abortion. Um, one third of facilities have conditional wording policies that instruct staff to only bring up abortion as an option if the patient brings it up first. Um, the last third did not have a specified policy uh, regarding abor abortions, excuse me. 
If women do choose to have a baby, there are many challenges with transportation between the facility and community health care providers, access to medical care and their living situations. Women report their medical needs are often delayed and inadequate. Many women are expected to work on hazardous or strenuous work assignments up until almost the day that they give birth. Women report that they have been threatened with disciplinary action or longer prison sentences when they attempt to modify their prison assignment due to their pregnancy. In my paper, I propose a number of solutions, um, including that every woman should be screened for pregnancy and offered a pregnancy test. Uh, during the screening, the healthcare provider should ask about menstrual health, menstrual history, uh, sexual activity, history of trauma, including intimate partner violence, um, contraception use, and provide follow-up care as necessary. Where gynecological care or pelvic exams are needed, physicians should use a trauma-informed uh, method. Unless requested by the medical staff or there is an immediate danger, correctional officers should not be present while the patient is being examined. Um, if and when a facility learns a woman is pregnant, they should inform the woman of all of her pregnancy-related options in a non-coercive setting. And lastly, as a catch-all, um, all treatment should be within the guidelines of the American College of Gynecology, the National Commission on Correctional Health, or the American Academy of Pediatrics. Like I said, this was a very broad overview of just one third of my paper. So I'd be happy to talk more about that later. Thank you. All right, can everyone hear me? Great. Good evening. I am grateful to be here. I will be talking about some of my work that I've been doing on my journal note topic. I've been working closely with Professor Golden, Professor Johnson, and I'm very grateful for their advisement during this process. I was also in Professor Golden's uh, seminar last uh, semester. And again, I'm grateful for the organizers tonight. So I am talking about and researching the lack of uh, health surveillance in prisons and the need for the cruel and unusual punishment jurisprudence to adapt to emerging digital health technologies. So as you may know, public health surveillance, that's a monitoring tool that allows for uh, the monitoring of diseases, physical, mental health diagnoses, uh, communicable health uh, diseases, so that there could be timely response by public health officials in the way of resource allocation, uh, implementation of health services. So we saw a lot of statistics tonight from the Bureau of Justice Statistics and that's a federal agency that's responsible for data collection for criminal justice matters. Last month, they issued a report on the impact COVID had on state and federal prisons. And the report reflected 2019 and 2020 data. And it showed from 2019, to 2020, there's been a 46% increase in prison deaths amid COVID. And that is incredibly alarming and frustrating because we are learning about this information in 2022. We're learning about 2019 and 2020 um, impacts of COVID now. Timely issuance of these reports is a matter of life and death in prison. And the overall lack of routine, standardized health surveillance in prisons, it's indicative of the pervasiveness of institutional racism in our cr criminal justice system. It's also indicative of the general apathy the public has towards people who are incarcerated. So to address this issue, in my paper, I look to the principle of equivalence 
which is a European Union standard um, when addressing um, cruel and unusual prison conditions. Uh, that says that prison healthcare that's available in prisons, it should be equivalent to what is offered in the community. I am also looking to the evolving standards of decency principle that has been used in US Supreme Court cases, uh, especially as it relates to capital punishment, uh, juvenile offender cases. And that says the Eighth Amendment, its words are not static, but should adapt to the changing norms in society, especially as it relates to uh, punishment. The mere existence of new digital health surveillance systems has changed the way in which we define quality healthcare in our communities. And it should also change the way in which we define quality healthcare in prisons. Some of the tools that I've been looking at, um, mostly employed by the World Health Organization, um, for example, GoData, it's a free to use tool relatively easy to use. Uh, it could be used online, offline. It offers a visualization of the data that you're capturing. Uh, that has been used worldwide uh, to track disease prevalence. The mere existence of these tools warrants a change in the ways in which we define cruel and unusual punishment. So just to conclude, if we were to modify these tools and adapt it for uh, the use in prisons, they must be used through the lens of transparency, dignity, um, and overall just humanity for the persons who are incarcerated. So those are just some of the items that I'll be looking at in my paper. And yeah. You or Vanya, one of them you want to speak? Um, well, I, I want to be thoughtful of people's time. I'm hoping maybe our, our panelists would be open to taking questions at the exhibition during the reception. I, I know we're a little bit over time and I wanted to have you have a chance to tell us how to get there. So <laughs> thank you guys so much. That was terrific. I appreciate it. Hello everyone, I am, can, first, can you hear me okay? Yes, okay. I'm Vanya Malloy. I'm the director and chief curator of the Syracuse University Art Museum, which is located at, when you exit right across the way. Um, so in the Schaefer Art Building. And I'm here, first of all, I wanna, before I introduce the exhibition, I wanna take this opportunity to thank everyone who made it possible. So I'd like to especially give a shout out to Lauren Golden and Emily Dittman for organizing the panel, making everything happen. And then as well to Maureen Blunderhasset and Megan Muller. I'd also like to thank all of our panelists tonight, Colleen Gibbons, Paula Johnson, Nicola Brown, Matthew Mayers, Molly Graham, and Jamela Suleiman. I hope I got that right. Um, so please join me in a round of applause for their contribution tonight. I think it was a fantastic event and I've learned so much and I hope all of you have as well. So the exhibition we're inviting you to see um, and there is a reception as well is titled Her Sister Incarcerated Women of Louisiana and it is up through March 11th. So there is time to see it. We're open late tonight till eight. Um, and there'll be wine and cheese and other good things. Um, but some of you may think, well, why Louisiana? Why, why is that the focus of this exhibition? And one is it's a traveling exhibition that was organized by the Newcomb Museum and Tulane, and Tulane University. That's their university art museum. So it originated in Louisiana and is now traveling nationally. But also because Louisiana since 1986 has been ranked in the top 10 states nationwide for the highest incarceration rate. And in fact, from 2005 to 2018, so that's quite a length of time, it ranked the first in the nation and the world for incarceration. 
Also, the incarceration for women is significantly higher than the national average in Louisiana. And some of the things we already heard tonight, so I won't go into detail, but I think it's worth mentioning um, just briefly is that the majority of women in Louisiana are incarcerated for lower level crimes, such as drug or property offenses, and 80% are imprisoned mothers, of which the majority are the sole caregivers for their children. One in 12 children in Louisiana have an incarcerated parent. And most of them overwhelmingly are survivors of prior abuse. So if you're interested in this exhibition, there's other information as well. We did uh, an interview with the co-organizers of the exhibition that's on the YouTube channel of the museum. And I'd encourage you all to take some time and to view it when you have a chance. So the organizers, I, as I mentioned before, the Nuka Museum in equal partnership with Sarita Steeb and Dolphinette Martin. And they're the ones who are part of that YouTube um, discussion which I mentioned that's on our website or on the YouTube website for the museum. And it was created in equal partnership with them um, and also with in, uh, formerly incarcerated women, community organizers and other stakeholders directly impacted by the prison system. So I know we're short on time, but I wanna encourage you all to take a look. So I won't go into detail about the themes and other things I hope to talk about. Um, and invite you to take a look. It's open until March 11th, as I said, and it is, you have no excuse. You're gonna walk right by the entrance. So I encourage you all, if, even if you can't stay long, come in and familiarize with yourself with the museum. We have many other related programs for the exhibition on our website. So check that out too. Thank you all.